Welcome to State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well, broadcasting on KSQD Santa Cruz on 90.7 FM and streaming at ksqd.org. I'm the producer and host, Deborah Sloss, licensed marriage and family therapist. We can all agree on one thing. This has been a very long and very hard year for just about everyone. And as this pandemic drags on, we want to take a closer look at the effect and additional demands it's putting on one of life's already big challenges, forming, maintaining, and or ending intimate relationships. Pandemic conditions have necessarily changed how we approach these relationships, requiring us to consider major risk right from the start, immediately needing to enter into direct and open conversations about boundaries, putting trust to the test, changing how we see or think about our future, and forcing changes in our preferred timetables. Those in relationships are having to make hard choices, sometimes moving in together sooner than planned, staying together longer than they might otherwise, and sometimes serving as each other's only companions. While those who are not in relationships face mounting difficulties in meeting potential partners and forming new relationships on the one hand, and aloneness and often loneliness on the other. Today, we'll be joined by three guests, Bryn Lowry, Adam Landfear, and Melissa Fritchley, to talk about what it's been like as a young adult trying to navigate intimate relationships in this pandemic. This is part two of a two-part series In today's conversation, we're looking at what it's been like for young adults trying to find their way into and through intimate relationships in the pandemic, while last month's show, episode number 28, explored the intimacy challenges facing midlife and older adults. A note for our listeners, please be aware that in this show, we will discuss sex as part of intimacy. Also, we ask that you forgive any sound quality issues. Due to the pandemic, we are all dealing with the unpredictability of recording from remote locations. Let me tell you more about our guest today. Bryn Lowry is a 23-year-old graduate of the University of California, Santa Cruz, who's living and working in Santa Cruz while she applies for graduate school. She's currently employed at the university as a research scientist studying primatology and isotope biochemistry and lives with her boyfriend, Zach who she's been with since September 2020. She and Zach began dating amidst the COVID pandemic after over a year of living together as roommates. They've spent the early part of their relationship quarantined together with a few other roommates, which has both posed challenges and built strength in their relationship. Now they await responses from graduate schools and contemplate moving across the country together. Adam Landfear, goes by he and says he's 22 years old and single. Adam is from a small town outside of Buffalo, New York, and moved to Santa Cruz, California five years ago to attend school at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He studied art, art history, and sustainability. In his free time, he says he likes to hike, work out, do yoga, create art, and try to make relationships work with men who he knows it will never work out with. Adam came out as bisexual when he moved away from what he called an oppressively heteronormative hometown. Once he was living in Santa Cruz, he quickly realized he's actually what he calls just gay. Adam's committed to do his part to try to uplift his fellow queer pals and says he works hard at trying to make everyone feel heard, understood, and accepted. Adam is joining us from being on the road in Costa Rica, where he literally just completed a month-long yoga teacher training. And finally with us is Melissa Fritchley, a holistic psychotherapist and educator, writer and workshop leader, a certified mindfulness meditation teacher, and licensed marriage and family therapist since 2010. She has a private practice in Santa Cruz, California, where she works with individuals, couples, and other relationship configurations. Melissa is the author of the Conscious Sexual Self Workbook. She's contributed to multiple online media sites, such as Psyched in San Francisco and Huffington Post. 
An award-winning educator, she's taught for holistic graduate programs for psychotherapists and currently provides supervision and professional training for Shine a Light Counseling Center. She teaches online and internationally about sex-positive self-awareness, healthy relationships, and body love. We're so excited to have these three guests here with us to talk about the impact the pandemic has had on intimate relationships, especially for young adults. Welcome, Melissa, Adam, and Bryn. Hi, Deborah. Thank you for hosting us. So glad to have you. So in terms of getting started, I thought a good place to start might be, um, Melissa, if you could tell us a little more about your work with couples and individuals and navigating intimate relationships and how that work's been changed in the pandemic. What do you see as most significantly changing for young adults in their relationships? Well, I think this, I mean, there's more pressure on relationships in general right now. Um, And in particular, finding those few people that you are in connection with, because the more casual connections, the ways that we used to be able to spread kind of our emotional sharing and our, our emotional needs across a broad group of people is so limited right now. Um, so there's lots of added pressure of um, how to rely on one person. And then also this question of how to connect to new people. Um, if you know potentially you're still looking for relationships that are going to be fulfilling, that are going to bring out something new in you. Um, so obviously those, those things have been really difficult. And also the younger generations are in particular missing a lot of life milestones that they can't celebrate in relationship with other people in the way that um, other generations have been able to. And so that sense of how do I share the progression of my life um, and how do I grieve or do something different when particular life milestones are not able to happen in the way that I expected or um, had hoped they would. Um, So a lot of those kinds of things, the ways that relationships progress and move forward right now is really thrown off, off balance. And everybody's having to figure out how do I do that from a unique new perspective? Um, so I know we're going to talk about the strengths and the, and the difficulties. And but one of the strengths is people are being asked to be really creative right now, um, which is easier for some people than others. And it's easier when you feel like you already have some capacity and some emotional resources to do that. Thank you. So why don't we turn to Bryn now? And we'd love to hear some about um, your history of relationships and describe the relationship that you began this past year and how it's been uniquely shaped by the pandemic conditions. Okay, so um, so yes, I am a young adult. I'm 23 years old and I just graduated from college. And so it's interesting throughout college, most of my relationship experience was pretty casual, um, either due to the fact that I was busy or exploring college and and college life or that I just didn't really have the time to put in to relationships to get them past the uh, casual state. So my history of casual relationships throughout college was honestly pretty unsatisfying. Before college, I had a couple of serious relationships that I felt a lot more satisfied in. Um, And so I think that maybe I got to a point where I realized that in a world where crazy things like a coronavirus pandemic can pop up, these casual relationships are not sustainable. Um, They're not going to be able to stand the test of these disasters. And um, so I sort of turned inward during the, during the pandemic, I was surrounded by a lot of friends. I lived with uh, many people including uh, my current partner, Zach, who moved into my house um, about six months before the pandemic. And uh, we started creating a friendship um, throughout our time living together in this house with many other friends. Um, We started getting pretty close, but he was in another relationship and I was really not in a place to uh, be in a committed relationship. Um, And then we all graduated. And everybody that I lived with, all of my friends moved away. And Zach and I ended up being some of the only two that actually stuck around in Santa Cruz. And we ended up moving in together into a new house. 
And then through living together in this new place, we started really getting a lot closer and started talking more. And because all of my good girlfriends had moved away from Santa Cruz, I really was relying on him and a couple of others who stayed in Santa Cruz to um, emotionally support me. Um, And especially him because we were living together and he was always there. And so after about, after a couple of months of living together and getting closer and closer, um, we sort of just, you know, as, as things happen, just ended up realizing that we wanted to be a lot more than friends. And I remember having thoughts that, you know, this person is such a big support system to me. And um, I just really feel comfortable with this person in a way that I haven't with a lot of people in my life who I have been intimate with. And so it was just sort of an exciting idea to enter into a relationship with somebody who I already felt so close to um, and who gave me a lot of feelings of security, uh, especially during this time where not a lot was giving me feelings of security. Um, So I think in a way, having him was one of the things that was going to help me get through. And um, I didn't really think about it too much. It just felt really good. And in a time like this, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's something about a pandemic that makes you sort of follow your instincts a little bit more. And that's really kind of what it was. We just both followed our instincts and that was about five or six months ago. Um, So we've been together ever since and our relationship has just gotten stronger because we've been together pretty much every day since we got together. And what would you say, you know, in terms of that story, Bryn, what, what aspects of it do you think you mentioned one about, you know, looking for comfort in ways that maybe you might not have otherwise, but do you think there are other aspects that really, Um, shaped the relationship that were influenced by being in the pandemic? Oh, definitely. I mean, spending this much time together means that we have to be able to communicate so well, because if he is upset or if I'm upset and we're not talking about it, we're just stewing together. And we can't really get away from each other. We don't have these other distractions that let you kind of get away from your significant other, talk to your friends about it, regroup, come back, and then talk about your issues, which was really how I dealt with issues in relationships before. I would take my time to sit by myself, think about what I wanted to say, and then come to my partner and have this pre-packaged, perfect little unit of what I wanted to say, but I can't do that anymore. I have definitely learned some new things. And I think that a lot of the time people, especially at my age who are young and trying to figure out who they are, make all these, you know, definitions of themselves of, oh, I'm a type of person who really needs my alone time to figure out these deep emotional states. And I think to a certain extent that's true, but it doesn't mean that we can't change. I think that I was really into this idea of myself and he has challenged me to kind of change the way that I deal with negative emotion. Um, And I honestly, like, I think I was really able to accept that and change my behavior because he was just always there. I didn't really get that chance to, you know, to say, no, Zach, leave me alone. I'm going to go because he's right there. So you've learned some new things through this. I'm wondering also, Melissa, is there anything as you listen to Bryn's story about that you really see as kind of unique to these pandemic times that you've seen with other people that you've been working with that maybe you want to highlight here? Well, it's really struck by how much she's finding this sense of a relationship coming from a place of comfort and that, that stability and trust with one another. And I think a lot of people are pulling away from the more casual, not only because of the risks related with COVID, but also because we're under so much stress um, that the sort of things that could be fun about maybe a more dramatic or more up and down kind of relationship um, are no longer fun. And a lot of us are finding we don't have energy for those kinds of things. Um, And so I think that 
a lot of people are turning more towards this, like, ah, a person that I can actually trust and my nervous system can relax with. And I, you know, we have a sense of stability and we can work through these things. Um, It's true for a lot of people right now. Um, And the, yeah, the up and downs of relationships, people don't have the energy or the bandwidth. And we also don't have other people to process it with, which also struck out in a story. You know, you might, if you're in a relationship that has ups and downs, you might process it with your friends at work and then you process it with your other friends. And then, you know, and, and we can do some of that on text or things now, but um, in truth that we're needing to turn towards that main person and process it um, much more quickly than we might've before. You're tuned to listener-supported 90.7 FM KSQD, Santa Cruz, K-Squid, Many Voices, One Station. And this is State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well. I'm your host, Deborah Sloss, and I'm here talking with research scientist and recent college graduate Bryn Lowry, another recent college graduate and soon-to-be yoga teacher, Adam Landfear, who are sharing their personal experiences with intimate relationships in the pandemic. Also with us is Melissa Fritchley, a licensed psychotherapist and educator who specializes in intimate relationships and sexuality. We're discussing how the pandemic is changing, how we go about forming, maintaining, and sometimes ending our intimate relationships. Stay with us to learn more, and we'll be right back after this brief message from our underwriter. KSQD thanks Family Service Agency of the Central Coast for supporting this program. Family Service Agency provides counseling and support for people of all ages facing life crises and challenges. You can reach them at 423-9444 to see if they can help you. Thank you, Family Service Agency of the Central Coast, for supporting KSQD 90.7 FM. Back to our interview. Adam, I'm wondering if you could also share some of your history of relationships. And while while you're not, I understand you're not currently in a relationship, you told me that you had both like started and ended relationships in the pandemic. And I'm wondering if you can tell us how, you know, those beginnings and endings have been different because of the pandemic. So my history with relationships, um, it's messy. It's not cute. Um, when I was growing up, you know, I felt different, felt oh, like, you know, why am I attracted to men, things like that. Um, came to California, to my Mecca. Um, and when I came to University of California at Santa Cruz, uh, I came out as bisexual in my first year, like my first day, pretty much, just because it's a label I could never really own confidently in my hometown. Um, time went on. And then I just started dating pretty much guys by the end of my freshman year of college. Um, and then I was in um, two, two serious relationships, I would say, throughout college. Um, I think for a while I was a bit of a serial monogamous. Um, <laughs> just really liked having that one person that I've never been able to have before like that. And found myself really clinging to one person. Um, so it made the breakups kind of devastating because um, I felt like, oh, it, it, this is over and now I'll never find someone, something like that. Um, and then I would, Bryn knows we live together, but I would kind of hoe around a little bit in between partners until I found someone that I could, you know, tolerate or be with a little bit longer. And then we would start hanging out and I was like, no, it's just casual. And then before I know it, we're just dating and I'm just getting into this situation again. Um, and I was dating somebody, really sweet guy named Matt, before the pandemic started. And we were dating for like a little over six months, I think. Um, and then when COVID started, we had started breaking up kind of right before COVID started. We were kind of doing off and on. It was mostly me initiating a breakup because I wasn't, he, he would live in San Francisco. And uh, it, was just, it was just a bit of a stretch and I wasn't ready for it. And we had a bit of differences. Um, and then COVID started and the world just seemed like it just fell into pieces and everybody's panicked. And I called him and 
was just like, can we just try it, you know, please? Like, it, like I think I made a mistake. Like, this has nothing to do with COVID. Like, I miss you. Um, and I think I was sort of just lying to myself. Um, so the relationship got like worked for like a couple weeks during COVID and then it eventually just fell apart. Um, and we ended it and I found it really hard to, um, cope because all of my coping mechanisms that I typically have, like going to hang out with friends or going out to the bars and meeting new people, um, all of that was kind of stripped away. So, um, found myself back on these great dating apps, love them. Um, and I met another guy and it was casual for a while. And then um, he wanted to pursue me. And then we started dating uh, sort of towards middle of the summer, like September or August, I think. Um, and we were together for a while throughout the pandemic. And he was my life raft for, for a while. Um, and then realized I had too much time with him and I didn't have my own sense of purpose and a lot of things I know we'll get into, but, um, we ended up breaking up a couple months ago and now I'm single. I'm trying to find my, uh, single, strong, badass self right now. <laughs> Did you find yourself, Adam, the second time going through that breakup, trying to use different strategies now that you were, you know, we were well into the midst of the pandemic. I'm wondering if, you, you know, found yourself using new ways to get through that breakup and what'd you learn about yourself? Yeah, I, um, I think it's a multi-layered question because on top of COVID playing a part, it was also a really rough breakup. And I think it would have been pretty bad despite COVID just because the nature of our relationship was very lustful. Um, it was very emotional. and it was very up and down. Um, so I think the things I turned to were, were healthier things. Um, because I think going out and partying, um, or just going over to friends and, um, staying up all night with them, that wasn't really that sustainable. And I also think when I graduated from college, I wanted that to change a lot too. But since it wasn't possible, I just started diving deeper into myself through my yoga practice, through my meditation, through my art. Um, and I had to just start to figure out what's the best road I can take that will safely lead me back to myself and like the version, and the authentic expression of myself that I want to become. Um, so I think COVID's really kind of expedited this process. And I'm excited to just keep following different paths um, until I can get to a place where it's like, oh, I moved on and I don't need to cling to someone like a life raft. You know, I have myself and that's enough. And I have my friends and I love them. I'm guessing, Melissa, you might want to jump in here. <laughs> oh, you said so much that's so rich and valuable. And, you know, one of the things that really stuck out for me is this, particularly for younger adults, how much you get from being reflected by new people in your life, by meeting new people and sort of seeing like, how do I show up here with these people? And um, that that's being taken away to a large degree, or it's, it's certainly much harder. And more limited, more limited for people. Yeah. Right. More limited. Yeah. And so it's sort of, you, you commit to, oh, here's one new person. I'm going to really commit to showing myself and showing up with this one person, um, which, which can bring again gifts, but it's also, you know, that freedom of just, I'm showing up and I'm meeting lots of new people and I'm moving amongst lots of worlds. I mean, Adam has done an amazing thing uh, by going, you know, to a different country altogether. And, and so he, I'm imagining he's getting this experience of, oh, here's- Some say it's, some say it's stupid. Um, <laughs> so, it seems amazing. you ask. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, well, I think it sounds great. And it's, I mean, imagining it's allowing you to have this experience of who am I, the core me, while in this whole new environment, which is so much about, about that early younger adult time of life, where we're hope, hopefully getting to try out new environments, find new worlds, so that you hone in, as Adam said, like, who, who am I, this path to finding um, 
yourself in, in this sort of strong, independent way. I also really noticed that he was uh, mentioning that in some ways the pa pandemic might have expedited a certain kind of um, evaluation about how do I go through these breakups and sort of pushed him to um, turn to new kind of coping strategies. And I'm wondering if you want to talk at all about if you're seeing that with uh, some of the other folks you work with, Melissa. I am. I mean, breakups are harder right now for a lot of reasons. And some of that is because we're, it's, it's within an already compounded grief time. Whereas, you know, we mentioned, and I'm sure we'll be threaded through here, we're grieving a lot of different things anyway right now. A lot of things that we thought were going to be available to us are no longer there. Um, and also you have to do it so much more on your own, you know, and, and you can reach out to friends, but they might, again, be at a distance. You can't just go and have that hug, that cuddle with a friend um, or just a drink with a friend, <laughs> you know, which is sometimes this, this way of soothing your body, of feeling connected. Um, and so you're having to do it verbally at best. Um, and, and as Adam mentioned, you know, I think in his, his bio, you know, he does art, he does yoga, he does these things. And I think people are needing to find these, these new kind of resources, or maybe not new to them, but having to rely on them in a new yeah. way um, to get through the emotional processing of things and, and the aloneness within mm -hmm. that. I, I want to acknowledge too, um, since, I mean, Bryn and I just recently graduated and uh, a lot of people were forced to move home or move in with their parents. And to some people that can just be taking a huge step backwards or it can really negatively affect their mental health because when, we, when we're home, we feel like we have to revert to an earlier version of ourselves, and maybe we're not comfortable with that version anymore or we're trying to grow away from that. Um, so I think especially for those people, it's really important to find your outlet that's going to make you feel like you can continue growing while being in a space where maybe you feel stagnant, if that makes sense. I love what Adam just brought up about uh, the challenges about how we l imagine and move into our futures. And, you know, I'm wondering what you're seeing about how this pandemic is affecting how you're thinking about your personal future and also maybe the future of your relationship. Bryn, do you want to take that question? Yeah. So, Having a very stable partner has been a huge asset right now. And I, I don't know if it's just me or my friends or if it's, you know, people who are, who are young, but the world is so uncertain right now. And I think that none of us are under the impression that things are just going to go back to normal and be great for the rest of our lives and that nothing like this is ever going to happen again. Um, especially with looming climate change and <laughs> economic turmoil and political turmoil. Um, none, all of us are in this headspace that things are probably going to be tumultuous for the rest of our lives. And so having a really stable um, partner, someone who really like helps you, through these times starts to become really attractive. Um, and so moving into my future, um, I'm thinking I've applied to graduate schools on the East Coast, which would require me moving away from all of my friends and my family. And the, the thought of going there with my partner um, really brings me um, a lot of comfort. You're tuned to listener-supported 90.7 FM KSQD, K-Squid, Many Voices, One Station. And this is State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well. We're also streaming over the web at ksqd.org. You can find the podcasts of all our shows on Apple and Google Podcasts and on the KSQD website. I'm your host, Deborah Sloss, and I'm here talking with licensed psychotherapist and educator Melissa Fritchley, who specializes in intimate relationships and sexuality. We're talking about how the pandemic is changing, how we go about forming, maintaining, and sometimes ending our intimate relationships. Also with us 
our research scientist and recent college graduate, Bryn Lowry, and another recent college grad and soon-to-be yoga teacher, Adam Landfear. Both are sharing with us their personal experiences with intimacy in this pandemic. I want to remind listeners that every State of Mind show has a resource list posted along with it, and the resources we talk about today can be found on the post for this show at ksqd.org forward slash state hyphen of hyphen mind forward slash. Now, back to our interview. I want to kind of talk about beginnings, you know, and how, what does dating and hanging out look like? You know, how's it been different since the pandemic? And I know, Adam, you've been doing a bit of that. So I'm wondering if you want to share what that looks like for you. I'll, t- I'll speak to um, platonic relationships, like friendships and stuff first, um, because the, the pandemics brought me a lot closer to the friends I was already tight with. And it's also steered me away from friends which are friendships which didn't serve me anymore or didn't serve the version of myself that I wanted to be anymore. Um, And in part, this has to do with college. And uh, when you graduate, um, a lot of people move away or move home. And so you have to work harder to maintain friendships. And the people I was tight with that moved away, we're still making time, we're FaceTiming, we're connecting. Um, But some people I was hanging out with um, They still wanted to just party and um, just pretend like it was another day at the park when I don't really think that was the case. Um, And I wanted to, I wanted to surround myself with people that would support a more like inward journey that I wanted to go on for myself. And I found myself just um, sort of ending friendships or, um, or letting go of friendships that I think would have maybe dissolved or faded away. Um, with time. I think that COVID just sort of, yeah, it just expedited that whole process um, because the word casual has a whole new meaning. Um, and a lot of that is wrapped up in the word chaos. What changes that chaos made me even more irrational, I think. Um, I was the guy that I started seeing in the summer. I think within two months of knowing each other, like one month of dating, uh, he ended up moving in with me. It sounds crazy when I'm saying it now. We had been spending so much time together um, and, and just being around each other all the time. We, we had never had like a formal discussion. Hey, like, let, like, can I move in with you? Or it was just sort of like, is this chill? And I'm like, yeah, sure, it's fine, whatever. Like, I love spending time with him. And I, I felt like um, because my job was, I was furloughed and, um, my my sense of purpose was was tied to the relationship and taking care of him and thinking that he needs me to do these things like cook and um, you know just it's really just like losing myself in the relationship um, and sort of yeah I think becoming a little bit codependent um, because I just felt like that was my new purpose was was being a like his partner. Melissa, what do you see with regards to how people are dating or trying to connect or, you know, in in intimate relationships? How's it changing? Like, for instance, Adam was just talking about how it sort of changed their timeline. Um, And I'm wondering if you want to talk some about that. Yeah, it's changing it for everybody. But I think for younger adults, it's, it's escalating the timeline in exactly the way that Adam was saying that in that, you know, young adults might also not yet have the job that's pulling them. They don't have necessarily kids to take care of or or things like that. Um, And so this sort of, what is my purpose? How do I find that? It's easy for a relationship to step in and and take on that role. Um, And so that struggle, but also that because the future is so unknown, it makes it much harder to talk about it, which then also makes it harder to have that as a part of what you're assessing for in early relationship, right? Because I don't know what the future is gonna look like. I can't present to you, um, you know, where I wanna live or what what type of work I wanna do. We can't easily talk about- Even how long I'm gonna be here for this relationship. Right, exactly. Um, You know, and as Adam touched on earlier, people may be living back in their hometown where they grew up, which might not be, 
might not be the group of people that they're most drawn to, but it's the group of people that are there. And, and so I think these questions of when is this going to open up and when do I get to restart my life in a way and start to look at where I want to live and what I want to be doing. Um, but right now there's this bubble in which it's really hard to even talk about that. And so it isn't a part of our beginning of relationship um, in a certain way. And so you might end up with somebody that, um, that is a match on these immediate levels, you know, which are often, you know, the lustful levels, the, the you know, sense of humor levels, which are all really important too, um, but less about these discussions of do we want to build a similar life together? Because for all of us, we're limited in the life we get to live right now. It might not be the life we want to build. So how do we show someone those things? Um, how do we communicate about the life we, we each want? Um, it's really challenging. You know? And it requires some speculation, lots of speculation about what if, you know, I think I would like to do this. I think I would like to do that. I think I'd like to live in this way. I'm wondering too, if we could talk a little bit about sex and sex play and, you know, navigating safety and sex, it's, it's complicated and challenging. And I'm wondering if, you know, either of you have had any experience with that, that you'd want to share. I think everybody has their own boundaries with COVID and you have to communicate with people and listen to their boundaries, just like any other boundary, you know, like what's, what's your safety level? Like if it's a hookup, it's like, um, are we just going to go for a socially distanced walk, maybe have a picnic or something? Um, and I feel myself wanting to trust people more before I um, would want to like engage sexually with them. Uh, it almost feels like I wrote down for this, like it feels like a new STI has been introduced to hookups. <laughs> like COVID's like this new uh, sexually transmitted disease where you know, if you both have negative results, amazing. Like you can just, you can just go right to Bangtown. But um, I think you have to be a little, there's a new level of cautiousness. Um, and when you're meeting somebody for the first time and you're just talking to them and they're like, yeah, like last weekend I was at my friend's party or, you know, mm -hmm. I've been, I've been going here and there and blah, blah, blah. You have to judge for yourself. Like, is this somebody I want to sleep with? Like, is this worth the risk of getting COVID? But I think it's it's definitely changed the dynamic of sex just because you're 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 thinking a little bit before you're thinking more about is this worth it? Which I think in my case is good for me. I probably should have been doing that for a long time, anyways. But yeah. <laughs> so you know, Adam was just sharing about the challenge of navigating sex and sexual play. You know, in the context of the pandemic and. Wondering, Bryn, if you two want to share something about your experience with that. Yeah. So I think that having a partner who you live with and who is already in your COVID bubble makes things a lot simpler. Um, Adam was talking about having to navigate COVID like it's an STI. Um, and when you already live together, that's it's great that that's just like not something that you have to um to think about but I think that one thing that I have run into that's been a little bit of a challenge in my relationship is um when people have different um when people have different sex drives when people have a different idea of you know how often in a week they want to have sex. Um, I mean, this is a common problem that I think people have in relationships, but when you're in a pandemic and you're living with your partner and you're spending so much time together, I think that these feelings get intensified. And I think that that has been one struggle in my relationship is trying to find the balance of when does he want to be intimate? When do I want to be intimate? And finding a way to communicate in a way where nobody's hurting each other's feelings, but we're still able to ask for space. And we have gotten a lot better at that over time of, you know, mostly it's, you know, me feeling comfortable telling him that I need some space or that I, you know, uh, in, in the beginning, when we started um, sharing a room, it, it 
was kind of similar to what Adam was talking about. It wasn't that we had, we sat down and we said, okay, well, starting tomorrow, we're going to start sharing a room in this house. It just sort of was happening. He was spending every night in my bed and I really loved having him there. But I had these feelings of, well, this is my bed and this is my room. And I really enjoy having that time to myself at night where I can turn the lights off and kind of lay there by myself and think about the day. And then all of a sudden he was there every night and I love having him there. But I think at the beginning it was this big transition. And I think that the intimacy really comes with that of, I don't, I don't have the energy to be intimate every night. Um, And so finding a way to communicate with him that I love him and I want to be intimate with him and I am attracted to him, you know, even if I need some space some nights. Um, And I think that we've gotten to a place where I'm very comfortable having him in my bed every night. In fact, that's where I want him to be um, every night. Um, But that I don't want to be intimate every night, Um, just in a way to give myself a little bit of space because he's going to be there every day and we're going to spend, we are going to spend all of this time together. We really had to figure out how to communicate, hey, I need some space. It's not about you. It's really just me needing space and I still love you. Um, And I think that after a couple of months of figuring this out, we have gotten to a really good place where um, I don't have to hurt him by telling him, hey, you know, I don't really want to be touched right now. Um, Hey, you know, I think I need to go like sit over here and read something on my laptop or read in a book or do some art or something. I need a little bit of space, Um, both in sex and just in regular life needing space and communicating that. So touching on what Bryn said and people who are living together and sexuality, um, this, yeah, this sense of high desire, low desire, mismatched desire is is obviously a huge component for people right now. Um, Theoretically, we all have more time to have sex and that's lovely, you know, (laughs) but but we're also highly stressed. We're also packed together in this way where the pressure is there. Um, And so just acknowledging that a sexuality and sexual desire is really fed by mystery right, and and spaciousness between us, the sense of I'm an individual being that you don't know everything about. And now, you know, we come together um, so that it can feel a little risky and a little, um, yeah, mystery is is sort of the best word, I think, for this, of um, I'm an individual person and we get to come together and share now. Um, So we need often both that sense of trust and familiarity, but also the mystery. And right now, um, that's a struggle is how do I have that? And sometimes it's, it's just enough to feel like I went out for a walk on my own and had my own (laughs) private experience. I saw my own tree um, that I can explain to you, whatever the case may be. But I think help having couples communicate about that directly. And, And as Bryn said, specifically, it's not personal, right? This isn't because I'm not enjoying you right now or I don't feel connected it's just that I need to feed that individual part of me so that I can bring sexuality to the picture so that I can come um, filled up to to being sexual with with you Um, so that's sort of the Bryn part of the answer then writing on what Adam said about you know meeting new people um, it is it is really hard right now because it is exactly like an STI, but a very complex one in which there's actually um, not a lot of ways to have truly safe sex with somebody new, um, even with tests. Right, those unless you've tested and quarantined, you could have been exposed. You you know um, you're taking a risk. Also, the early sense of needing to connect being um, very much verbal and visual. Um, which younger generations are more familiar with and maybe more comfortable for them. Um, so in some ways that, that you benefited them, like we can connect this way. We're used to sending visual communication, pictures and things. Um, but it also um, is really limiting for people who might not feel comfortable with 
photos of themselves, right? Um, or sharing photos in that way. They may not feel like photos represent who they are. They don't get to have that other sense of meeting me and feeling my sexual energy, feeling our connection. It becomes this flat, here's an image. Do you like that? <laughs> you know, and, and that's that can be really challenging for a lot of reasons, um, either because maybe how you present visually doesn't, again, represent who you feel you are, right? Or because of body image issues and, and shame and things about having to present this way um, in the same way that other people are not, not as comfortable communicating verbally, right? Talking about sex is hard already <laughs> for a lot of people. Um, trying to talk explicitly about sex with somebody um, through whether it's video or phone or otherwise um, can be really challenging. And so people don't get to shine in that way. And it also adds this level of stress to early sexual engagement. Sometimes that's, that's hard. Yeah. And just listening to what you were saying in terms of all the different layers of challenge, I just want to point out, you know, earlier Bryn mentioned, well, you know, I, yeah, I had some loss, but I still have a job and a place to live. And, and yet there's all this this, this background stress of these kind of negotiations and, you know, prioritizations. And like you said, you know, thinking about every contact I have impacts everyone else that it peoples my life and, and that that is profound and exhausting. And that is shared by everyone going through this pandemic together. And I think a lot of times we minimize that you know, and don't really notice what that's taking from our psyche and energy. Right. And they're not all choices. You know, some people are forced to live with family members and they have to make those people a priority. And those might not have been their most important people <laughs> otherwise. Right. Right. <laughs> like, you know, absolutely. So. Absolutely. Especially for, for this age group that we're talking about today. You're tuned to listener supported 90.7 FM KSQD, K Squid, Community Radio for the Monterey Bay. And this is State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well. We're also streaming over the web at ksqd.org. I'm your host, Deborah Sloss, and I'm here talking with research scientist and recent college graduate, Bryn Lowry, and another recent college graduate and soon-to-be yoga teacher, Adam Lanfear, who are both sharing their personal experiences with intimate relationships in the pandemic. Also with us is Melissa Fritchley, a licensed psychotherapist and educator who specializes in intimate relationships and sexuality. We're discussing how the pandemic is changing how we go about forming, maintaining, and sometimes ending our intimate relationships. Stay with us to learn more, and we'll be right back after this brief message from our underwriter. KSQD thanks Shine a Light Counseling Center for supporting State of Mind. Shine a Light provides affordable counseling for couples, individuals, children, and families in English or Spanish in Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. More information at www.shinealight.info. Again, www.shinealight.info. Thank you, Shine a Light Counseling Center, for supporting Community Radio, K-Squid, 90.7 FM. Now, back to our interview. In so many of our shows, I do like to talk about stigma because it's usually this hidden force that creates barriers um, for us in our lives. And, you know, I got to thinking as I was thinking about relationships, if there is stigma associated with, you know, trying to initiate or start intimate relationships. And then also, Adam, I was specifically thinking you know, is that amplified in any way because of being gay or queer? And I'm wondering if you personally have experienced that in any way that you might want to share. Yeah, I can, my experience and a little bit of what I've seen is um, as a gay person and as, as a queer person, a lot of queer people, I think, share this feeling of, um, I, you know, I need to find that one person that gets me um, or that, you know, sees me how I want to be seen, um, we're more likely to go out there just searching, like searching, searching, searching for the one person that can do that for us. 
and it's exhausting and sometimes you meet somebody who sees you and then you realize maybe they're not the one for me and then that hurts it hurts so much more because your options are pretty limited when you're queer and when you're gay for who you can choose it's not like you're straight and you can just go out to a bar and just assume everybody's straight and it's easy and you can talk to everybody it's like you have to be cautious if you talk to the wrong person and hit on them I could get beat up you know um this isn't unique to me this is a lot of queer people's experience so I think COVID COVID's stressful for that because it even more makes you feel like uh, like I'm I need to find that person but I have to be so much more cautious now um, and I, I think people might cling to the wrong person because of that panic and that frustration of not finding that one person. So um, <laughs> I guess if I have some advice too, it's to anybody listening, um, take care of yourself first, love yourself first, um, and then the right person will come along hopefully and just join you on that journey of loving yourself and loving, you know everybody else as well. So just very briefly, I'm wondering if any of you have any closing thoughts that may be something you haven't had a chance to say that you or something that you really want to amplify and be sure people get, you know, as a parting comment. Um, yeah, sure. I think that I would just like to say that, um, you know, what I've learned in, through this pandemic is that your whole world can change so quickly. And so not going into relationships, not being afraid to change a little bit has been really useful for me. And it hasn't been easy. Um, I've definitely had growing pains. But knowing that the tools that you're going to need to go forward in this world are different than they were a year and a half ago. And so the things that you're going to need out of a relationship are probably going to be different. Beautiful. Adam? Yeah. Um, something that Bryn said that's resonating with me still is um, if you feel like you're starting a relationship right now on shaky ground, um, ask yourself why it feels shaky and explore that feeling. Um, I know I denied myself a lot of that just because uh, I'm good at convincing myself of stories. So um, take time to think about what it is you want and um, and follow your gut. Uh, don't make decisions in, in haste because a lot of bad decisions are made when you don't think them through and don't rush into anything. Um, and find your new normal. And find something that works for you. Thank you. Melissa, are there any last comments, anything you haven't yet gotten to say that you really want to be sure our listeners hear? I mean, I think I just want to say to everybody that who you are individually is a gift um, and it's going to be a gift to a lot of people throughout your life and to utilize this time to let it be a gift to you. Like, enjoy getting to know yourself, um, you know, as Bren said, in as you change, because we're all changing, we're all going to keep changing. That doesn't stop post-pandemic or at an age, a particular age. Um, so just, yeah, appreciate yourself and be curious about yourself and know that who you are just as you are is, is going to be a gift to people. Maybe Maybe you haven't met those people yet, Probably you have, um, you might not know it, but you're certainly going to be a gift to people throughout your life. In Your Voice are short segments where listeners get to add their voice to the discussion. You can either call in to leave a message or record an audio file right on your phone. Either way, tell us a mental health experience you've had about something that has contributed to your mental health recovery or share a resource that has helped you. Submission details can be found on the State of Mind program page at ksqd.org. Upcoming show topics are the mental health of first responders and obsessive compulsive disorders. If you have experience with either of these, we want to hear from you 
and your voice may just be part of one of our future shows. And when it comes to intimacy in the pandemic, we heard from this listener. Hi, I'm a university student and I'm 20 years old. I think I've been a bit of a pessimist when it comes to dating, particularly meeting someone online. During the pandemic, however, meeting people in person was increasingly difficult. I thought I would download a dating app just for amusement and never meet up with someone. I was skittish of using it and deleted and downloaded the app like several times. However, on my third try downloading it, I started talking to this guy and I felt an instant click. After about a week of talking, we decided to meet up in person. I knew this was a risk during the pandemic, but I really loved talking to him, and we only lived a few blocks apart, so there was no real traveling involved. Uh, We went on a date, and it went really well. (laughs) However, the next day, I woke up to a text from a close friend saying she tested positive for COVID-19. I panicked. I was terrified of the virus and also terrified that I had just met this really great guy and possibly could have infected him. I went to get tested, and I texted him the situation. Very embarrassing. And um, it took less than 24 hours to get my test results back, and they were positive. He immediately got tested as well, and also tested positive. Even though we had just met, we decided to quarantine together. So after meeting once, we spent almost 14 days together straight. Honestly, the time flew by, and even though it was not an ideal situation, I loved every moment I got to spend with him. I don't think I could have spent that amount of time with anyone else and still be excited to see them every day after. Um, It has been six months since then, and we are still together. For me, it's insane that I met someone I truly love um, during this pandemic. Of course, this is not to say that COVID-19 is a positive. I'd like to think me and my boyfriend would have met if it weren't for the pandemic, but who knows? I'm just glad I met someone who makes even the darkest moments bright. This is your host, Deborah Sloss, and I want to say a huge thank you to our guests today, Bryn Lowry, Adam Landfear, and Melissa Fritchley. And thanks to you for joining us here on State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well. To hear more conversations about mental health and wellness, join us on the first Sunday of every month from 6 to 7 p.m. right here at K-Squid, 90.7 FM. Special thanks to Jeannie Baldzikowski for audio production and to Jennifer Young who assists with research and outreach. And thanks to acoustic guitarist Adrian Legg for composing, performing, and donating the use of our theme music. You can find all the past episodes of this show on our ksqd.org website by typing State of Mind in the search bar. Or subscribe and get them delivered directly to your listening device on either Apple or Google Podcasts. Or listen through your home smart speaker by saying, play State of Mind podcast with Deborah Sloss on TuneIn. If you like this and any previous State of Mind episodes, please help the shows get heard by more listeners by leaving us a rating and a review on Apple and Google Podcasts. This is listener-supported community radio, KSQD Santa Cruz. Just remember, 90.7 FM, K-Squid, your ink spot on the dial. Stay with us.